not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Amen. If you keep please uh, standing and we'll worship. I got to go up and unmute the band. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Well, um, I would like to welcome our newest worship team member. This is Becca. So we're very glad to have her. <laughs> All right, let's pray and we'll do some worship. Um, Lord, I just thank you so much for everyone here. Thank you for getting us here, God. Thank you for um, just leading us by your spirit into a relationship with you. And I just pray that uh, whatever we have gone through throughout the week, um, however we've messed up or whatever's gone on, that we would just lay it at your feet. And um, we just thank you for your forgiveness and your love for us. And just pray that you bless the time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen.
you guys want to be seated, I have a few announcements. Um, first of all, ESP this Thursday, uh, creamy Italian chicken for dinner and sign up if you plan to join. Um, meal train for the Cox family, uh, so look in your bulletin for the link for that and there's some November dates still available. Um, October 25th, there's going to be a volunteer appreciation dinner, so um, if you aren't a volunteer yet, like Tra Travis was saying, sign up and then you can come to that <laughs> and <laughs> have a free dinner. <laughs> um, so RSV to Michelle um, or sign up on the back counter by October 18th to reserve a spot for that, um, for child care and for food head count for that. Uh, corporate prayer next Sunday at 1.30 in the barn. So uh, if you want to come to that, it's at 1.30. Um, look in bulletin for save the dates activities. And that's all I've got for today. So let's keep worshiping. If you guys want to stand, you can. If you want to sit, that's fine. So.
this is a, an old familiar song, but I kind of do it a little bit differently. So here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone things that we thought were dead breathing your son to shine on darkest nights for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song Jesus we love you oh how we Oh. 
took these rags and made us beautiful. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be an anthem song. Jesus, we
love you and just uh, thank you again for um, what you're going to share with us today and I just pray that you would fill each person here and uh, just bless the time and the study in your name. Amen. So our, uh, good morning, Calvary Chapel Billings. Um, I know you guys were expecting a special guest, so I got a haircut um, <laughs> so you could see that. Actually, my special guest, my, my good buddy, um, he was traveling from Minnesota, and he hit South Dakota yesterday, and they went into a clinic and found out uh, um, some of the family has strep, so they could not make it this way, so they went straight south from there to, they, they live in um, California, Yosemite, right? I think that's how you pronounce it, something like it, yeah, California, so, um, so you could be praying for them, so he, he gave me fair warning yesterday morning, <laughs> well, I was at some uh, soccer games, so, at noon, so, um, we are going to continue through the book of Jeremiah, so with that, um, you can turn to Jeremiah 4. We're going to finish up chapter 4 and then do some of chapter 5 this morning. And so we haven't been here in a couple weeks, uh, but really, again, Jeremiah wrote this book to speak. Well, God had Jeremiah write this book to speak to southern Israel, known as Judah, to get them to turn. And this was um, 30 years, well, roughly 30 years before they would be taken over by Babylon. And we have since been, we talked about in chapter 1, his call and commission. Chapter 2, we talked, he gave his first sermon against Judah, um, talking about its faithlessness, its refusal to acknowledge guilt, and then he's going to, what chapters 3 and through 6 are all about is his second sermon talking about there's going to be a coming judgment. And in that, you'll see sprinkled throughout this sermon a call, an appeal, a plea for Judah to return to him, to return to me. And we've been talking about this. So what we're going to Continue through in chapter 4 is again a further description of the devastation that will be caused by this um, army from the north, coming from the north, really. It's uh, Babylon. And we will then describe a people that are completely alienated from God. And I titled this, Do You Want What You Have? And you'll see why I titled it that, but it's a question for each and every one of us. And God's a gentleman. He will respect one's, wish, one's wishes. He'll do everything he can to have a relationship with you. But if you want what you have, you're going to get what you have. And unfortunately, um, we know there's two ways in which um, there's a broad way and there's a narrow way. And um, you get to choose that. And you'll see that. And what he's going to identify with the people of Judah is that they are taking the broad way, leading to destruction. And that's what he's, what's going to come about if they will not turn back to him. So with that, let's get into the text. We'll start in verse 23 of chapter 4. And we'll read to the end of the chapter and then we'll pray and we'll get into the scriptures. It says, I beheld the earth. And indeed, it was without form and void. That sound familiar? Right? And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed, they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed, there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed, the faithful land was a wilderness. 
and its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken. I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise or the, of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself bare. Your lovers will despise you. You will seek your life. The anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion, bewailing herself. Sorry, I just noticed I skipped. That 40-year-old curse on my eyes, huh? So, so I'm beginning in verse 30. We're going to go back to 31. Haven't done that before. Okay, for I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor. It's kind of important. The anguish as of her who brings forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands saying, woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you uh, for just uh, this passage. And Lord, in the midst of your judgment against Judah, you still are calling out for them to return. And Lord, uh, again, you will do everything in your power to have us turn. Lord, you'll do everything to have us return to you. Lord, I just thank you for that as you see that throughout the scriptures. But in this passage, uh, we come to understand that, uh, again, you're a gentleman and you will honor our request, Lord. But, again, you wrote this so those that would hear might change their direction and follow you. Lord, just ask as we go through this study that you'd be speaking to hearts and speaking to each one of us. And just ask this in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen. 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 Sorry about that reading. Okay. So the first thing you see at the end of chapter 4 is um, a prophetic vision given to Jeremiah of this coming judgment. And he really kind of gives you a description of what it's going to look like when they come and take this nation out. Um, some people have labeled this decreation um, a description. This is also remnant, this is also symbolic of or figurative to the day of the Lord. Um, talked about so often throughout the Bible. The day of the Lord really happens when God brings down his wrath on this earth. Starts with really the tribulation and then continues into the thousand year millennial reign and all the way into the great white throne judgment. Um, but we're not doing an end time study here, but this is what a lot of this verbiage he uses in, these passage, in this passage is similar to the things you see. I have passages like Re Revelation 16. You see some in Isaiah 24, Isaiah 13, which was written probably 100 years before this passage, speaking of this day of the Lord when God brings his wrath down on individuals and actually rules and reigns for a thousand years also. But with that, he describes what the earth looks like without form and void. It's similar to what he said in Genesis 1-2. Uh, the mountains and hills, describing the landscape, usually the mountains and hill um, are symbols of strength and stability, but here they're going to tremble and totter um, at this point. And can you imagine? We're, we're in a pretty mountainous area. If you can imagine those mountains moving and stuff like that and hills moving, um, pretty scary event. And it says the, there'll be no men because they'll be hiding. The birds will even f flee away. Um, and even the land and cities will be um, barren and broken. So you have this description, as it has been describing earlier, of what happens when Babylon comes through and takes out Judah. But it also is a picture, again, foreseeing the future when God's wrath would be poured out on the world. Um, and so pretty unsettling, you know, uh, 
I said, uh, well, it was written in an unsettling reminder that sin and rebellion against God lead to darkness and chaos. And that's what you see. And so you see this vision given somewhat similar to a description that we see in the book of Revelation by, through, given to John of what it will look like in days and and a lot of times when you go through prophecy in the Bible, it has a near fulfillment and a like far out fulfillment, far out, um, further out, uh, far out. That's a 70s term. Prop some of you guys back, I imagine, right there, right? But uh, further out fulfillment, and that's obviously in future to us and future to them. But this will happen in their days as far as what's going to happen as soon as Babylon comes and takes them out. And what he does in the midst of this, and he'll do, continue to do, he'll promise that he will not make a full end to the people of Judah. And we know, because we have the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, and we have individuals that will eventually return back to the land through Nehemiah and Esther and those books, um, they'll return back to the land. But um, as far as this goes, it's going to happen for 70 years. He's going to um, basically remove the pollution that's happened into his land for 70 years, and then he'll return them. But he makes a promise in the midst of all this that, hey, I'm not going to completely annihilate everything, even though you read verses 20 through 26, and it looks like exactly what's happening, but he says, and we know God to be faithful, cannot lie, it says the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. And he says this five different times in the book of Jeremiah, five often representing the number of grace in the Bible. You see it in, you'll see it in three times today. You see it in this verse, and then you see it in chapter, chapter 5, verse 10, and verse 18, and then all the way into chapter 30, verse 11, and chapter 46, verse 28. So he promises that there's going to be a remnant. And he says, but I will not relent on this judgment that's coming down. And again, it's not because he was not unwilling to relent, but because um, they would not repent and make good with the Lord. Um, that word relent, there is the idea of a deep grief, a sorrow of a parent for a wayward child. Um, and again, he doesn't do this to be vindictive. Right? Hopefully, as the parents in this room, we don't punish our kids to be vindictive. There's a reason we do it. One, because they got, the Bible tells us to. That's how we to train up our children in the way they should go. Um, we know from the book of Hebrews, um, we're not to despise God's chastening because there's growth allowed in those things. And so what he's saying, he's doing this, um, one, for a redemptive purpose, not to be vindictive. Um, you know, and he's patient, and he has been patient with them. But what we'll find out is this nation is way, way gone. Um, we know of his patience, spoken about in 2 Peter 3, 9, common verse, um, one we all should have memorized. Um, but it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that reminds me of Ezekiel and what he says after. So Ezekiel speaks probably about 40 years. Well, it, in their captivity, Ezekiel's also speaking to this people. And he says, you need to understand that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does not. He wants you to turn back. And he says that a couple times as you go through the book of Ezekiel. And again, he'll be patient, but at one point, um, when all his warnings are ignored, um, nothing but judgment awaits. And that's what you'll see with these people. Um, they're ignoring every warning. And Again, we got 50 more chapters of this, warnings and warnings, and just showing, again, God's patience, um, wanting them to turn. And through that, 
he says, this is what I'm going to be doing. I will not make a full end. I will not relent. I will not turn back. But, and he says, this is what I'm predicting from you. You will flee. I'll, I understand that when your enemies are coming, um, you're going to be play, trying to play the best game of hide and seek ever. Right? You're going to be running into the mountains, into the thickets, trying to get away from these individuals. Um, but you will also, he says in verse 30 and 30, and when you are plundered, what will you do? Though, and what he goes on to describe is they'll try, and he gives us a word picture, he'll, they'll try to seduce their enemies. And let me actually read this in the NLT. It says in Jeremiah 4, verses 30 and 31, what are you doing? You who have been plundered, why do you dress up in beautiful clothing and put on gold jewelry? Why do you brighten your eyes with mascara? Your, your primping will do you no good. The allies who, you were, who were your lovers despise you and seek to kill you. I hear a cry like a woman in labor, the groans of a woman giving birth to her first child. It is a beautiful Jerusalem grasping for breath and crying out, Help, I've been murdered. And NLT gives you a better rendition of that, looking into that. But understand, he says, um, one, you, you're making a mistake. You're trying to put your trust into these allies and what they're going to do. And he calls them not only their allies, but their lovers. Um, you want everything of these other nations, but they're going to seek your life. And that's not a good thing. Um, they're going to want to put you down. And then he gives us this graphic picture of a woman in childbirth seeking. And can you imagine? Well, I can't imagine. But I was there when my first child was born, right? And what? All three, all three of them. I was there for all three of them. Um, and uh, just a nervous wreck, let me tell you. Um, I drank more co I drink a lot of coffee. But I, oh, man, I, I drank a lot. I might have had two or three pitchers worth. So, but, um, <laughs> but all to tell you, I, I can't imagine, you know, after having, well, while having your first child, you know, asking for help, that those around you who could offer this help want nothing but your death. And that's what he's saying. In this vulnerable position, all the people around you are there just for your destruction, for your murder. And that's the picture he gives to these people. Um, and what they have done and what God is commenting to them is they've placed their trust in allies and their own cleverness rather than depending on God. They've dressed up. They've tried to seduce their allies, what they consider their allies, and yet they will turn on them. And even after being plundered, it says. With that being said, then we go into chapter 5. And let's read a few verses and we'll discuss. It says, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, if there's anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O oh Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have, not, you have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, I said, surely these are the poor. They are the foolish, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. I will go to the great and speak to them, for they have known the way of the Lord, the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Therefore, a lion from the forest shall slay them. A wolf of the deserts, de desert shall s destroy them. A leopard will watch over their cities. Everyone who goes out from there shall be torn into pieces. Because their transgressions are many, their backslidings have increased. And so what we see in chapter 5, beginning in chapter 5, is kind of an interruption to the description of the coming northern army and what they're going to do in bringing down judgment. And what he's going to do is give justice on why God has to judge. 
and he's going to go over specific sins against Judah. And the first thing he describes here in verses 1 through 6 is the fact that they were ungodly. And he does this by way of kind of an investigation given to Jeremiah. He says, hey, go throughout the city. And what we see here is really one of 10 or 11 what we call, uh, what are they called? Symbolic pictures, symbolic. Uh, we see just a picture given so it can relate. Uh, well, let, me, let me go back. It's like a parable here. We see a picture given so they can relate um, to what's going on. And what you have Jeremiah doing, he's going to act out the message rather than just speak the message. Um, and this often happens since people won't listen to God's word, what Jeremiah is going to do. And he, he does this throughout the scriptures. Is, well, throughout this book, he acts out so that they might see the picture and respond to the picture. Um, we see this often in Ezekiel. He does a lot of strange things, if you remember. I think one time he sits on his side for 365 days or something like that. And all these were given to Ezekiel to do um, as a picture of what was going to happen to Judah. And here we have the first one given, and what he is asked to do is go investigate throughout the city um, and find anyone who executes justice. Who, in, and that's the idea of anybody. Can you find anyone who's honest and seeks truth, who's reliable, has integrity? Just one. Just one. Um, one of my favorite verses is Second Chronicles 16.9. And this is God's response to those who execute judgment and seek truth. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart are loyal to him. And we have the exact opposite here. He says, just find one. Find one individual in the city, and I will pardon this city. Does this remind you of a story back in Genesis, right, with Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham negotiated with God. Like, don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he went, started at 50, went all the way down to 10. There's 10 righteous in this city. Don't destroy it. And we obviously know what the ramifications of that were because there was not 10 righteous. And only Lot and his family got out of that city. And yet, how much worse has it gotten that here Jeremiah is to only find one individual? Or, you know, I'd have... I'd, picked up a baby and go, hey, maybe, you know. <laughs> you don't know what he's thinking, but hey, this, this one seeks justice and truth. Um, but yet we know that he cannot find one. And he says they even swear falsely just because they say as the Lord lives. And that's the idea, uh, the idea that they put their hand on the Bible. They're going to be honest. Um, and that's one of the terms they used. And he says, well, as we've seen throughout this book, words acknowledged, they have many words that acknowledge that God was their God, but their lives denied their words. And what they did is they swore falsely. And, and what you instead see, you don't see Jeremiah finding anyone who executes judgment or seeks truth. Instead, you see attitudes of rebellion throughout the city. Um, they not grieved, it says. They refused correction. Um, and what he did as he's doing this maybe investigative journalism um, that he's partaking in, he then goes to the poor first and says, and looks among the poor and says, ah, uh, he couldn't find one there. He goes, well, maybe because they don't have a religious background. The education's poor. And so then he goes to the wealthy, and he says, hey, they have the opportunity to hear the word. They know the word. They know God's judgments. And yet, he doesn't find anybody who seeks 
justice or ex well executes justice or seeks truth. And so what we know, you know, wealth or position or lack of have nothing to do with knowing God. And that's what he finds out. He says, all together, everyone that I've visited, there's not one, not once. Can you imagine? Um, uh, this makes me excited about where I live because, uh, you know, I see 40, 50 people in this room that hopefully have this attitude of seeking, being honest, and seeking truth. And, you know, and across this land. And we just never, we just don't want to get to this point where we can't find a single one. And what it says of the individuals, it says, but these all together have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. And again, the yoke is a tool that's used on animals to plow the fields. It's given usually on two similar animals. And what it's showing, what it's sharing with us is, yes, there is a, an ask of God when we come to follow him that we are to serve him. But we also need to understand that um, if we don't serve God, we're serving the world, we're serving our flesh, we're slaves to sin. And you can choose either a known or you can choose an unknown. Um, you can choose to follow God. You can serve. You know, there's a song. Some of you guys know back to the 70s. Um, um, Jamie knows because me and Jamie both love this guy. Um, but he was a Christian for a while. Um, I don't know where he's at now. But um, Bob Dylan said, you're going to serve someone. Uh, and I don't know the rest of the song, but he did say you're going to serve one of the, some, the devil or I don't remember the whole lyrics, but that's the idea. You are going to serve someone and you get to choose. And it always reminds me of the passage in Matthew 11. It says, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or here, what they refused to do is follow the Lord, and they took the yoke from the world. Um, and what's interesting, uh, and when I think of this passage and how it applies to us, sometimes we forget why we came to the Lord. And I know why I came to the Lord. Obviously, because God was drawing me. Um, but I, I, at one point I understood that um, I was running my life and not doing a very good job. Um, and I was still, you know, I felt I had success, successes as far as getting through college and all those things, but I was a mess internally. And what I understood is that I was going to hand my life over to the Lord. And, and what I've gained to know is um, there's no better hands to be in than the Lord's. And yet what we see is these guys have forgotten that running their own life is not a good option for them. Um, it's been said that God gave us brains. You know why he gave us brains? So we could know who's boss. And unfortunately, <laughs> some of us have used those brains to think we're boss. And that is a bad situation. Um, and he says, you guys have started to run your own life. Remember, a lot of this is individuals that know the Lord, have known the Lord, have walked with the Lord. Remember this passage, this book, speaks about backsliding more than any other book in the Bible. And here, they refuse correction, they're not grieved, and it says your transgress transgressions, and that's the idea of knowing what's right and doing the exact opposite, have grown, it says the transgressions are many, your backsliding has increased. Um, and understanding that to be in a backslidden state, um, you have to almost go out worse than you came in. Um, because at th that point, you have truth still speaking. You've 
known the truth, you've heard the truth, you know what's right, um, and you have to basically go out harder than you came in to the Lord. Um, and that's the idea that you, whatever you did before you came to the Lord, you had to go into harder. And um, it says your backslidings have increased. And it says because of this, you'll be punished by these animals that uh, the lion represents Babylon. I don't know about the wolf <laughs> and the leopard, um, but uh, these animals, it's just not a, a good thing um, when you, you meet any one of these animals in nature um, on your own. Uh, it reminds me of a pa passage in Amos 5.9. It says, in that day you will be like a man who runs from a lion only to meet a bear. Wouldn't that be exciting? Escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against a wall in his own house, and he's bitten by a snake, right? Um, that's Amos 5.9. It's a great passage, and that's what is happening here. Um, you want your way? He says you can have your way, but it's, right? The way of a transgressor, Proverbs says, is hard. The way of a transgressor is hard. And he's all together says, you guys have flown, you've fleed away from me. And so that was their first problem. They were, again, ungod. what did I say? They were, they were ungodly. And then we talk about being ungrateful. That's what you see in verses 7 through 9, the fact that they were ungrateful. Let's read that. And it says, how shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods when I had fled them to the full. Then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were like well-fed, lusty stallions, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Um, often, uh, what represents ungratefulness, I think. Often ungratefulness is represented by covetousness. Not being content with what God's given you and going after other things. And you see that in this passage. Um, he says, you guys are, un you know, the children have forsaken me. They've gone after idols. They've committed adultery. Just the idea that God takes this personally. Um, you've committed adultery against me. Um, it says, even though I have fed you, and what you see also in this lack of gratitude is they attribute all this prosperity, all this wealth that they have currently at this time, um, they attribute to their foreign gods rather than give the credit to God. Um, and so, and again, it's interesting that often individuals turn from God when things are going good, not necessarily when things are going bad. And like you kind of see that in this picture. You guys have been well fed, and yet you're coveting. Um, really, you're starting to act like animals, like lusty stallions. And you got the picture there. Don't need to go much further into that. Um, but he says not only that, you're, um, I don't even know the term, one maid after a neighbor's wife. What did your friend call that? Cat calling? Something like that. I don't remember what it's called. Um, but I'm glad I don't know the term. Uh, but, you know, hooping and hollering, and not towards the wife that God's given you, not towards your spouse that God's given you. Um, instead, towards neighbor's wife. And this is specifically given as a commandment. Um, commandment number 10. Uh, in the great, uh, you know, the, the, in Exodus 20, where it talks about the Ten Commandments, this is number 10, the idea that you're not to covet your, your neighbor's wife, his things, you know, his animals and those things. And yet that's what you see, again, because of the lack of contentment with what God's provided for them. He says, because of all this, shall I not pardon you? Shall I not punish them? And he's asking them the question, I mean, would you punish? We know the Bible speaks of 
the things that are going on here and what the replication, um, repercussion for each one of these things are. And it's death. He says, should I not pardon you? Should I not bring this judgment upon you because of this ungodly situation, because of this ungratefulness? And the last thing he talks about in verses 10 through 19 is their um, unfaithfulness. And because of that, it's going to bring about devastation. And we'll finish it up in verses 10 through 19. It says, go up on her walls and destroy. So these are directions given specifically to Babylon. But do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about the Lord and said, it is not he, neither will evil come upon us nor shall we see sword or famine. And the prophets become wind, for the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. Therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you speak the word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and these people would, and it shall devour them. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know. Nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are, all, they are all mighty men. And they shall eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and your daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities in which you trust with the sword. Nevertheless, in these day, those days, says the Lord God, I will not make a complete end of you. And it will be when you say, why does the Lord our God do these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve aliens in the land that is not yours. So here, again, the last thing you see is a picture of unfaithfulness. And he says, the first thing you've dealt treacherously with me, and because of that, I'm going to bring about this, bring about the ba Babylonian, Babylonians to, but Notice, and we learned this from the book of Job, that even though the Babylons, Babylonians sorry, will bring um, about destruction, the enemy has a leash. We need to understand that. From the book of Job, we learned this. Right? They're only allowed to do certain things. Um, remember, uh, basically, Satan comes before the Lord and says, you know, basically, the only reason Job doesn't curse you is because you've given them everything. And what we learn from that passage is, I want to be like Job, um, except I don't want to go through what Job went through. Um, <laughs> I want to be like Job because we know that at that point, his 10 kids are taken out. All his wealth is taken out. And yet it says he did not curse God with his lips. It's still, every time I say that, it just amazes me. I want to be there. Um, got a far way to go, um, for sure. And, and what we know is then, but in saying that, Satan only had, he, had, he was given certain re restrictions. He couldn't go as, as far as he wanted to. And then he goes back to the Lord again before God and says, um, you know, even though we've taken everything away from him, we haven't touched his body. If we touch his body, he'll curse you. And what we know from Job is, again, he doesn't curse God even when he has boils. And um, which is, again, just giving us a picture of how far Satan is allowed to go. He's on a leash. Um, the enemy is on a leash. And you see that even with the Babylonians. He says, I will not. And he repeats this, like I said, five different times. But do not make a complete end. And I don't know if it f helps you find some comfort in what you're going through sometimes, but understand that sometimes there's a purpose bigger than your suffering. Um, and sometimes God's doing it for character growth. We've talked about this as we went through Romans 8. Um, um, and understand that God sees the bigger picture. And... Um, what he promises 
even while suffering and going through these things, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that he's with you, and um, he will comfort you in those things. And that being said, he does continue to describe what this um, nation will look like and the fact that they'll bring down judgment. He, he includes Israel because Israel has already gone through this, and that's the northern part of this nation. Um, their sisters, um, we consider sisters, um, have gone already through this uh, judgment by the Assyrians. And Judah, you're going to receive the same fate. And not only because you dealt treacherously with the Lord, but you also have lied about me. And really, you see just a huge case of denial here in verses 12 and 13. Um, the idea that, you know, not, again, they had this confidence, this false confidence that God would not touch the city of Jerusalem. One, because it had the temple, because they were God's chosen people. And yet, he says, this judgment is knocking on the door. You need to turn. And God says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Galatians 6, 7. And he says, um, don't have this false confidence. I've sworn that this will happen because you will are unwilling to repent. And it says, even the prophets don't represent me. Or, and verse 13 is somewhat hard to understand because it could mean a couple things. One, um, the prophets aren't representing the Lord or the people aren't receiving the message of the prophets. And we see both cases happening throughout the book of Jeremiah, throughout all the prophets. Um, so you could take it either way. Um, um, and it says um, the prophets have become wind. That's like a slam, like they're wind bags, right? They're just not speaking on my authority. They're speaking on their own authority. Um, and unfortunately, we live in a day and age when people um, can get behind a pulpit like this and give you what they think. Um, and that's not where you want to be. What you want to hear from is what God thinks, not what I have to say, right? Uh, we're all, um, as my pastor used to say, we're all bozos in the same boat, right? And we need instruction from the Lord. And we don't need to be windbags and just give, you know, 10 ways to be successful. Um, we need to ascribe, prescribe, describe what the Word of God says. That's where we get our instruction from. Um, and it's kind of a play on words because that same word for breath, oh, sorry, that same word for wind is the same word we got for spirit, right? And so it could be either these prophets are not speaking from the spirit, and you can see that from the next verse, for the word is not in them, or the sp spirit of God is not working on the individuals that are hearing this message. Um, and they're basically stop. they're stopping, they're, they're not using the Bible as is, it was intended, and I like the acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Right? That's what the Bible is. And more importantly, it's a love letter written to each and every one of us from God. And therefore, he says, starting in verse 14, and what's interesting, if everyone real quick could turn back to Deuteronomy 28, I'll give you the page number in a second. Just kidding. Page 201 for me. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, verses 49 and 52. To give you some context, this was written roughly 800 years. 800 years before what's going on in Jeremiah. About 1400s. 1400s. And look, and what God does in Deuteronomy as he's talking to the individuals that will enter into the promised land by way of Moses, um, well, actually through Joshua, but he's, Moses is writing this down, and 
what he predicts here, starting in verse 49, is a curse that if they're disobedient to what God's commanded them to do, this is what will happen. And in it, isn't this interesting? It says, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly nor show favor to the young, and they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you are destroyed. They shall not leave you grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you on all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust. Come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you on all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. And again, we serve a God who knows the beginning from the end. He writes this down 800 years before. And, and I say that because as he's referencing this passage, as Jeremiah is sharing this with them, they understand what, again, these people had a, somewhat of a knowledge of what the word of God said. And yet they were going against it. And this would have brought attention to the cursings spoken about in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And this would bring about attention to each and every one of them. And what you see really in verse 14 is kind of like a, a hellfire and damnation preaching. And um, sometimes... I don't want to say all the time, but sometimes that's a good thing. People need to understand um, that there's a conviction of sin that individuals need to hear that leads to repentance. Or what can happen is they can serve the judgment for rejecting that conviction. And see, in, in verse 14 it says, Because you speak the word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire and the people would and this people and the and this people would and it should devour them this is only funny because we just watched the left behind series with my boys and the two witnesses he, how many of you guys seen the left behind series the movies right um, and eschatology and all that stuff i i had some problems but <laughs> some things certain things but it was in, in the production all that but it was good uh because it had my boys ask all sorts of questions like who the Antichrist is and all this stuff. Um, but I just remember the prophets spilling out fire out of their mouth. It was, it was awesome. Um, and I can just picture it here, there in verse 14. And basically, you know, you can um, listen to the word or the word's going to bring about judgment on your head. And that's what you see in verse 14. And it goes on to say, um, and describe this nation that will come upon you guys, upon, not us, upon uh, these people. Um, it gives a more accurate description of them. And you see that in verses 15 through 17. And he says, you know, their quiver is like an open tomb. Their weapons are going to be basically dropping a lot of you individuals. Um, and it's not a good thing. And notice, though, in verses 10 and 18, that he still makes a promise to the remnant that there will be some spared. In Habakkuk 3.2, which is written, if I remember correctly, also towards the people. Um, well, written to Habakkuk um, in the sense of written at that same time because... Habakkuk was asking questions about um, the fact that their nation had fallen, of w fallen from grace and what are you going to do about it? And Habakkuk is answered, I'm going to bring about a nation to take you guys out. And Habakkuk then questions, why would you bring that nation? They're despicable. And what he says in the end, as God corrects his thinking um, and tells him, well, I'm God and I get to do what I want to. Um, and he, what he says in the end, I think the last chapter is a, really a praise to the Lord. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. And that's what you see in this picture. 
we see God remembering mercy in his wrath, despite bringing this wrath down on the people because they were unwilling to return. And what you see in the end, um, in verses 18 and 19, nevertheless in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you, and it will be when you say, what does the Lord our God do to these, do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your lands, so you shall serve aliens in the land that is not yours. And again, the question I started out with this morning is, do you want what you have? And here, what God is going to give them is an answer to their question. So why? Why is this coming down upon us? He says, you're going to get what you want. You want to serve these foreign aliens. You want to serve these foreign gods, these idols that you made up. You're just not going to do it in my land. I'll go let you go do it over there. And that's what happens. They're taken to these foreign lands to serve, um, forcibly serve these idols and these other gods um, rather than do it in God's land. And, um, and again, when I think of a passage like this, we need to understand that, uh, well, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, there's a, a, a huge principle, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It's funny because uh, Pastor Wayne mentioned to this verse to me just a couple of days ago, but it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, admonition upon whose, whom the ends of the ages have come. And so what this passage is saying in 1 Corinthians 10 is we need to learn um, that this is not the way in which to go. Um, and we need to understand that who we serve and God will do anything and everything to get you to follow him. And understand that that means follow him. That means listen and obey to what he says. And he'll do that for your good. And unfortunately we think, um, some people think that there's freedom out there in the world doing whatever they want and yet we know the Bible teaches that if you're doing what you want to do you're, you're a slave to the flesh you're a slave to sin and what God wants us to do is learn from these passages that we need to follow him and continue to follow him and listen and obey and, um, and I know you know most of you and that's what we're doing we're listening and obeying the Lord but I know you know that I wouldn't be asked to teach through this if God wasn't trying to speak to an individual who's trying to go the opposite way, trying to do their own thing. And, and we could do this all in different aspects of our life. Like, Lord, hey, I got this taken care of. I've been here, done that. Um, I have experience. Don't worry about this. I'll, I'll do this myself. Um, let us never say that. Uh, we need to understand that he wants all of us, all of us. Right, um, I just think about my marriage. Right, I don't, you know, give my wife eighty percent. Like, yeah, the other twenty percent you need not ask about, and you need to leave alone. Um, I'll give you eighty, maybe seventy-five percent today. Um, what she wants from me is all of me, just like I want all of her. Right, and that's the same relationship God wants with us. He wants us to give everything we have to Him. Um, so we don't get in a position like this um, and we're used as examples, as good examples because here's a bad example of those who would not they would just do lip service to the Lord rather than follow him and so hopefully that speaks to someone either here or someone listening that God wants all of you right? and um, unfortunately not well, not unfortunately, but that's a cool thing that we have a God that's so personal that because, you know, I might know, not know you well, but God does. And think of that. Though he knows you, he still wants a relationship, a personal relationship with you. And that's a cool thing. And that 
almost brings me to tears every time I think of that because I know me. Um, and sometimes I'm tough to hang out with, <laughs> even in my own head. Um, as fun as I think I am, <laughs> I'm still tough to hang out with. And yet, God wants that relationship. And he wants that for every single one of us. And don't we serve an awesome Lord? Amen. Amen. With that, let's pray. Lord, just thank you again for your word. Thank you for this picture. Um, just this bad example of thinking we can do this world without you. Lord, just help us increase in our dependence on you every day in our walk with you. Lord, help us forfeit those things that we've taken control of and give them back to you. Lord, understanding that it's a relationship you want. And Lord, help us give everything to you. Lord, and for those who have or are in this backslidden state, your simple cry to them is return to me. Return to me. Lord, just ask that you would convict their hearts and they would just come back to you. Make it right with you. Lord, it's easy just by asking you to forgive them. I just ask that you would do that in someone's heart this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for being personal. Thank you for your love for each and every one of us. Just ask that you would bless the rest of the day. We just ask this in Jesus' name. And we all say? Amen. God bless, guys.